Hello, hello. It is so good to be here. Um, as soon as Jen and Hona invited me to speak today, I started just getting really just stirred with a message that I want to share. Um, but before I get to that, I, I feel like I need a little disclaimer here. Okay, if you invite me to a party, I have two vibes. I either am like fun, laughing, loud, harmony. If, you, if there's a game happening, you've been with me, I'm all in, like all in. It's like scary competitive, all the fun, all the fun. Or I am in the corner talking to like one person and we take a deep dive into the problems of the world and philosophy and you know, all the things, because I just, I don't do chit chat. So I don't have like an in-between. I'm either like party harmony or I'm like deep dive harmony. So in first service, I party harmony was not involved at all. It just went, it was, I took everyone to the deep end and I didn't even tell them we were gonna take a dive. So I'm giving you warning that party harmony wants to come to parties, but today we're gonna do a little deep dive harmony, if that's okay, okay. You good? Okay. Now you've been warned and we're good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now here we go. <laughs> literally, literally, this has been one of the most difficult seasons of my life. And for those of you, I mean, some of you just heard a little snippet of my story in the intro. And so for those of you who know my story, that is saying a lot because I am a person who has I, I, I already had a testimony. I didn't need another, I got 25 testimonies. I didn't need another testimony, okay? But I, I really found myself in a painful season. Um, first and foremost, I found myself in the midst of a very unexpected, painful divorce. It was the death of a partnership. It was the death of a union. And in many ways, it felt like the death of a dream. Um, in addition to that, while I was going through that, in January, I went to my doctor because I've been dealing with chronic pain for five years, another final thing. <sighs> um, so, but at that appointment, we ended up with some very alarming results that led me on a two month journey of having to rule out cancer. And I would love to tell you that I was this person of faith who was like, I rebuke cancer in the name of Jesus and I'm healed and all the things. Trauma brain at that point, I was losing my marriage. I was in the midst of that trauma and trauma brain was in effect. And how many of you guys know that trauma brain is fantastic at catastrophizing? So trauma brain said, you're gonna die. That's it. This is it. This is how your story ends. This actually makes the most sense, right? You are just going to die of cancer. And thankfully, I had a community and friends and people to lean on who prayed for me when I couldn't find it in myself to pray for myself. And thank you, Jesus, I do not have cancer, okay? Thank you, Lord, I don't have cancer. And I did find myself in the hospital in March with a number of very bizarre symptoms and ultimately ended up getting diagnosed with a rare neurological disorder that has really caused quite a stir in my life, to say the least. I've had to uh, make some major adjustments. God is good because since it's a rare disorder, there are only a few treatment places in the world and one of them is in LA. So I was able to access an intensive outpatient program that gave me some tools to um, navigate this diagnosis. But so I'm going through divorce and medical trauma and so much pain, so much pain. And you know, the thing with the, the divorce and the marriage ending, I alluded to this a moment ago that it felt like the death of a dream. And some of you guys know this part of my story and that I was married before. And when that marriage fell apart, God gave me a promise that he would restore family to me and that he would redeem the dream. And so I truly, fully believed with my whole heart that that second marriage was the fulfillment of that promise that it was the dream being redeemed 
And so not only I w- was I losing the partnership, but I was having to grapple with this question of like how and why I thought this was your promise to me. But what I can tell you that I know that I know that I know is that no, it doesn't look like I thought it did. It does not look like I thought it did. But God is a redeemer and he is still redeeming and my story isn't over. And it doesn't look like how I thought it would, but I know that God is good and that he is redeeming. And what has carried me through this past season is pretty much one thing. And I would like to submit that this one thing is potentially the most powerful agent of healing and change. And that is relationship with God and with others. Relationship with God and with others has absolutely carried me through this season. And the truth is, is that so much of the pain and trauma that we experience as humans happens in the context of relationship. So much of the pain, right? Abuse, betrayal, abandonment, rejection, all of, all of these things wound us and the healing also happens in the context of relationship. The pain happens there, the healing happens there. And I'm not sure what kind of season you're in, but listen, I, like if you're in a good season, good for you, okay, great, that's fantastic, God bless you, but so many people that, that I talk to are going through it, earth is hard, and people are in pain, I have been just surrounded with people who have had devastating loss, and medical diagnosis, and so many painful, difficult things, so if you're not going through a hard season right now, that's fantastic, chances are the person next to you is, right, earth is hard, but there is hope, and I can only Preach what I know, and I know that I know that I know that God is good, and there is hope, and that healing is available to us, and that relationship is the pathway. So I want to start by sharing with you um, a piece of writing from K.J. Ramsey from her book, The Book of Common Courage. And this excerpt that I'm about to share, I feel like really encapsulates some of what I've experienced in this past season, and it's a powerful piece, so I want to share it with you. It says this, when life makes us feel stuck, scared, or small, the storms of stress separate our minds from our bodies and hearts and ourselves from one another. Fear can turn our hands to fists and our feet to flight. We sink into overwhelm and shut down in storms of stress in an effort to survive. But rushing and retreating aren't exactly the path to strength and joy. It's hard to pray when we feel powerless because our bodies need the presence of someone else to soothe us and speak us back into safety. Fear and distress temporarily disconnect us from the language centers of the brain and the calming, regulating power of the prefrontal cortex. But the presence of another safe, empathetic person can bring our minds, bodies, and hearts back together again. When we don't have words, we need a witness. We need witness, witness. We need a witness. We need someone to see us. We need someone to bear witness to our lives, to our pain, and we need witness. We need to know that we are not alone and that we do not have to carry our burdens by ourselves. We need a witness and we need witness. And I'm going to give you a heads up. I know we're in church. I, um, I love science and I love research. I just do. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to start with the science, but I promise you I'm going to circle it back and tie it into the Word of God in case anyone here is getting nervous about that. Are we good with that? Okay. But we're going to start with the science. Okay. So what K.J. Ramsey is describing so poetically and so beautifully is our natural God-wired survival response. God has designed our bodies and our nervous systems 
to survive, and he has created our nervous system to respond to threat in a number of ways that ensure our survival. So when she says fear can turn our hands to fight, to fists, she's describing fight. And our feet to flight, she's describing flight, which is another nervous system response. And we sink into overwhelm and shut down in the storms of stress. She's describing freeze. So essentially, there are four major ways that we respond to stress and, and trauma and to the, the, the sense of unsafety. Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. I will say is fawn is um, also known as freeze and appease. And some people actually think it's just a function of freeze. But for the purposes of today, and because I think fawn is such an important nervous system response to understand, we're keeping it as a, a fourth category. So fight, in fight, we move towards the threat aggressively, right? In flight, we move away from the threat. In freeze, we find ourselves unable to move, shut down. And then in fawn, we please and appease the threat. And you can see all of these different responses in nature, um, and this has all been backed by science, right? So when we're in a state of fight, we feel maybe agitated, angry, and rigid. When we're in flight, we can feel pressured and speedy and anxious. Freeze can feel numb, helpless, hopeless, and shut down. And fawn can feel like being shut down to ourselves, to our own selves, our own wants, needs, and feelings, yet hyper-vigilant to the needs and wants and feelings of other people. A healthy nervous system is able to flexibly move between all these various states of arousal. So a nervous system that has not experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of stress, someone walks into the room, they startle you, you, ah, and you're heart rate jumps up and maybe you got ready to run or you got ready to punch someone or whatever. And then you realize, oh, that's just my brother and I'm actually safe. And then a healthy nervous system can then return to a baseline, return to the state of safe and social, rest and digest, which is safety, right? But what happens for many of us when we've experienced so much stress, so much trauma, we get stuck in these other nervous system responses. We get stuck in fight, right? We get stuck in flight. We get stuck in freeze. We get stuck in fawn and people pleasing. It is fascinating to me. People pleasing is a survival response. And I, I have a lot of experience with this one because for me, people pleasing, the fawn response was how I learned to survive my, my childhood. And, and all of the, the trauma that I experienced, people pleasing was a how I did that. I shut down to myself and I became hypervigilant towards the needs of others. People pleasing is a survival response. So the other piece of this is she describes, KJ Ramsey says, the presence of another safe, empathetic person can bring our minds, bodies, and hearts back together. What she's describing is something known as co-regulation. It's when our nervous systems actually um, are in tune with one another and we can co-regulate together. So for example, when my child, I won't say which child, but when my child finds themselves upregulated, in a tizzy, freaking out, it would be completely unhelpful for me that I'm gonna be like, you gotta stop freaking out right now, right? Because now, like, both of our nervous systems are activated, right? And there's a saying that my somatic stress therapist says that I love. She says, the strongest nervous system in the room wins. So for me, when one of my children is in a tizzy and their nervous system is completely dysregulated, my number one job is to figure out how to regulate my own nervous system so that I can help them return to a sense of safety and co-regulate. And the process of co-regulation starts in the womb. The, the unborn baby begins to hear the sound of their mother's voice, and this actually becomes a, a comforting sound to them that they can actually recognize. There are studies that have shown they can recognize their own mother's voice after they're born. Her heartbeat, the rhythm of her heartbeat, right? This is all the process of co-regulation, and God designed our bodies to do this with one another. 
Then once we are born, and this is in an ideal environment, in an ideal environment, we are then born to caregivers who can bring, insert their loving presence into our world and arrive for us and meet our needs. And before we even develop language, right, we're beginning to learn some things that are hardwired into us. We are beginning to learn whether or not the people around us will be responsive to our needs. We're beginning to learn whether or not we are safe in the world. We look to the cues of the people around us to tell us, our caregivers, if we are safe. And if caregivers are able to consistently insert their loving presence into our lives and arrive and meet our needs, then we develop what is known as healthy attachment, right? This is an ideal situation. We know the earth is hard and things are not always ideal. And there are so many circumstances that can disrupt the development of healthy attachment, the death of a parent, separation from a parent, a, a parent illness, the illness of the baby who was born and might need for medical reasons to be separated from their caregivers, illness or, you know, of the, of the parent. There are so many different factors that come into play here that can then disrupt our ability to develop these healthy attachments. There is hope. We have flexible nervous systems. We can learn and adapt and, and develop healthy attachment styles, but there are things that disrupt this process. For me personally, my mother struggled with a substance abuse issue pretty severely. And my grandmother tells me this story. And I was six weeks old, and she came to visit me. And I have pictures of myself at this time, so I know the story is true, because I have pictures of myself as a six-week-old baby. And my eyes are sunken in. You can see like my bones of my face. You can see the skull on my head. My skin is so thin because I am malnourished because my mother's breast milk was so um, filled with drugs that I was refusing to eat and therefore starving. And my grandmother came and she tells the story. She says, Harmony, I saw you and I said, I am taking this baby home and I'm gonna fatten her up and I took you home and I fed you and I fed you and I fattened you up and your mama didn't even recognize you when I brought her back. And so. On one hand, I had this experience of my caregivers not being able to arrive for me, even with my most basic need of food, right? And on the other hand, I had another person step in and then respond to those needs, my need for food, and foster some healthy attachment, right? But there are definitely things that can happen that disrupt our ability to attach. And there are so many amazing, fascinating stories, and I really contemplated uh, studies that have been done, and I contemplated walking you through all of the research because it's fun for me, but I don't know if it's fun for you. I think the bottom line is this. <laughs> the research has landed on this. There are a few main attachment styles, and if you're interested in the, the um, research, you can just Google attachment theory and how about that, and you'll find all the fun studies. But basically what's happened is this idea of attachment theory is that our primary caregivers, um, as they're available and responsive to our needs, allow us to develop a sense of safety and security. And when we learn that our caregivers are dependable, it actually then gives us the sense of safety that we need to go out and explore the world. We have a secure base. We know how we have a secure base to return to. So then that gives us the confidence to go out and explore the world. And you, have you seen that with your children? Or for those of you who don't have children, that sometimes when a child is in a new and unfamiliar environment, they might cling to their, their parent. They're seeking that safety. They're seeking co-regulation. And once they feel comfortable, then they go out and explore. But listen, I mean, isn't that true for us too? When we have safety in our connection with God, when we truly, truly are walking and, and trusting that God is there for us and will meet our needs and that he will not leave us, then doesn't that give us the confidence and safety then to go out and do brave things and walk in what he's called us to do, right? There it is. It's that secure base. It's the healthy attachment. And so um, researchers have uncovered four major attachment types some of you guys in here are like, don't put me on a box. I don't want a box. It's fine. I'm just talking about styles and frameworks. Some of you guys are signing me up for the quiz. I want to know which one I am. But in either case, these are essentially patterns of relating 
um, and that I feel are helpful to explore and to name because I feel like if we don't know what's going on with us and we can't really name it, then it's difficult to you know, find solutions. But if we can see something and name it, then we can face it and then potentially move through it and find some healing. So the four major attachment styles are this, secure attachment, anxious attachment, attachment, dismissive avoidant, and fearful avoidant. Fearful avoidant is also sometimes called disorganized, but I prefer the term fearful avoidant, so we will be using that today. Someone with a secure attachment style might have an internal dialogue that sounds something like this. I can trust myself and others to show up and meet my needs. Someone with an anxious attachment style might have an internal dialogue that says, I need others to feel okay. I don't feel okay in myself and in my skin unless I know that you will never, never leave me, right? There's like some fear of abandonment happening there. And then someone who has a dismissive avoidant style might have an internal dialogue that says, I can only rely on myself. I can't trust other people to show up for me. I am the only person that I can trust at the end of the day. I'm all I've got, right? And finally, the fearful avoidant attachment style has an internal dialogue that might say, I, I crave connection. I crave connection, but I'm afraid of it too. This is actually one that I really relate to before a lot of healing happened for me in my process. You know, I had that where it was like, I really want connection, but I'm so afraid of it. And so what that looked like for me is that I chose relationships with people with avoidant attachment styles. Why? Because they were avoiding me. And that felt safe because we didn't have to get too close. And then it triggered my anxious attachment. And then I was the chaser. But if the second they turned to me and were like, actually, I really do like you. I was like, oh, peace out, bye, right? Like, no thank you because too close, too much, right? That, that's been a lot of fun for me in my history. <laughs> Led to a lot of very, you know, exciting relationship experiences. So um, someone with a secure attachment style, they might feel confident. They're, they're capable of having reciprocal relationships. Um, they tend to be able to manage their emotions well. And they tend to have a high view of themselves and others. Hey, I feel good about myself. I feel confident in myself. I know I can meet my own needs. And I, can, I feel pretty confident that I can also trust other people around me, safe people, to help meet my needs as well. Someone with an, an anxious attachment style might experience a sense of emotional hunger, um, a fantasy bond. Oh, we just went on one date. Oh my gosh, they're so amazing. We're going to totally get married. He's the best person I've ever met in my whole entire life, right? Like that whole thing just is based on a fantasy bond. And that is very common for someone with an anxious attachment style, also for someone with a fearful avoidant attachment style. Um, they tend to have a high emotional reactivity and a low view of themselves and a high view of others. Like, I don't feel good about me, but, and I need you to make me feel good about me type of thing. Someone with a dismissive avoidant attachment style, they might tend towards extreme independence. They might avoid or dismiss other people. They might feel kind of emotionally distant, emotionally disengaged or unavailable. And they tend to have a higher view of themselves, but a low view of others. I can rely on me, but I can't rely on you. And then finally, fearful avoidant might desire a closeness, but feel it. They have a lot of kind of internal conflict over that. And because of that internal conflict, because of that ambivalence, they can maybe be more unpredictable in relationships because they're vacillating between I want closeness, I don't. I love you, I hate you. Come close, stay away from me, right? So they tend to have a lower view of themselves and others. And if you look at this next diagram, essentially what's happening is our response to our attachment wounds tend to be one of two things or both, either avoidance or anxiety. So you can see someone um, with either a secure anxious attachment style, they have low avoidance, I meaning they actually want connection with people. But someone with a dismissive avoidant or a fearful avoidant style, they tend to want to avoid people, whereas someone with a fearful avoidance style is both high in anxiety and high in avoidance. You see that? So the bottom line is two of the ways that we respond to attachment injuries and disruptions in attachment are anxiety and avoidance. Okay, I promised I was going to bring it back. Here we are. You ready? Okay. Genesis. We're going to go back to the beginning. 
Garden of Eden. What is happening in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve are there. All of their needs are met. They have access to everything they need for survival, for thriving. And they are living in perfect intimacy and connection with each other and with God, right? Now, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. In other words, there was nothing standing in the way of their connection to each other, and there was nothing hindering their connection to God. There was nothing hindering their attachment to God. There was one exception in terms of what they had access to, and you guys know the story. The serpent comes and, they, and says, um, you're not going to die if you eat that one, fruit from that one tree in the middle of the garden. God just said that because um, he knows that your eyes are going to be open and you're going to know good and evil and you're going to be like him, right? Paraphrasing. And this is where I believe the disruption and attachment happens. Not necessarily the moment that the fruit was eaten, but with this, this first thing, mistrust in God, wait a minute, can I really trust God to meet all of my needs or is he holding something back from me? Maybe he is holding back from me. Maybe I should take that fruit in the middle of the garden. Maybe God is not as good and generous as I thought he was. So mistrust seeps in and begins severing and disrupting the attachment. And then we see how do Adam and Eve cope with the attachment wounds? This is how they do. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They began hiding and covering. They began avoiding, right? Some of us who have an avoidant style might tend to mask, right, as a way of avoiding and pretend and hide and cover, right? So that's one of their responses. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day, And they hid from the Lord. They ran and hid. That's the flight response, right? That's anxiety. And they hid among the trees. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? They responded to their disruption and attachment with anxiety and avoiding. There it is, right there. Isn't that nice? Brought it back. Told you I'd do it. Okay. So how do we heal attachment wounds? And... I know what the research says, but I was really praying as I was preparing for today. And I was like, God, show me in your word where we see the research supported with scripture, right? And I found it. All day long, I I just kept feeling the Lord say to me, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment. This is tricky greater, there we go, than these. And I don't know about you, but I could literally like deal with this scripture for the rest of my life, wrestle it out. If this was like, if I had no Bible and this is the only scripture I had and I had to spend my life trying to figure out how do I love God with my whole heart, mind, uh, you know, all of it. And how do I love others as I love myself? Like that's enough to keep me busy for a whole lifetime. I don't know about you. So the first thing in terms of healing attachment wounds is this, fostering attachment love with God. Love the Lord your God, right? And that disruption and attachment that happened at at the time that is known as the fall of man, right? This huge disruption and attachment happened between us and God. This huge separation between us and God, what, did, what does Jesus do? He comes to repair our attachment. He comes to repair our attachment. We sang earlier, and I was so excited, and I, I was like, did the worship team have my notes? We sang Emmanuel earlier. And what does it say here? It says that, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. It's one of my favorite names of God. It means God with us. Jesus came to this earth as a repairer of our attachment with God. God with us. God who never leaves us. God who is always with us. God whose whose love is absolutely unfailing. Jesus is repairing disruption. 
And then in the last recorded words that Jesus says in the book of Matthew are this. And I am with you always, even to the end of the world. These are the last recorded words of Jesus in the book of Matthew. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. God is with us. God is is giving us the experience of withness. Jesus, Emmanuel, Jesus with us. He is repairing attachment. When I first began my walk with God, you know, this is like I was about 21 years old, and I actually got totally tricked into going to kind of a servicey type thing. They, my friend was like, you want to go to a hip-hop show? I'm like, yeah, of course. And I didn't know it was a Christian hip-hop show, so of course they had a little sermon at the end. And um, so I wasn't ready for all that. But this, this man, he got up. And he just spoke for about five minutes and he talked about how he had been a drug addict and how he had been on the streets and I had never heard a testimony before. And he shares the scripture in John 15, five and he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me, abide in me and you will bear fruit. But apart from me, man can do nothing. My, My life began to change that night and it's because of this. I began asking one question of God. What does it look like to abide in you? What does that mean, God, to abide in you? I recognize that I'm like that withered branch that is separated from you, that is trying to do life on my own, but it is not working. I was in the strip clubs under the control of a pimp, living a crazy life. Didn't think I'd live to see 21, okay? And, and so I began asking that question, God, what does it look like to abide in you? This, this picture of the vine and the branches, this is a picture of attachment. You can't get much more attached than a branch to a vine, a branch receiving all of its sustenance, its nourishment, its life-giving power from the vine. And so that question began to change my life because as God revealed answers to me of what my next step was and what it looked like to begin to abide in him, I began making changes in my life based on that question. And I'll tell you what though, I was like, ooh, I like a fruitful life. And I, I bought into the idea that I think a lot of us do. And I I initially thought that meant like life is just going to be peachy, okay? God is going to provide for every single one of my needs at all time. I will never go without. I will never have financial insecurity. I I thought fruit was, you know, happiness and success and a pain free existence. That was a wake up call learning that. Just because we love and believe in Jesus does not make us immune to the suffering of life. But what it does mean is that God is with us in the suffering. He is with us in our pain. He does not leave us in our pain. And if, and if we let him, he is able to use every, every, everything that we have been through and use it for good if we let him. He will redeem every bit of it. So how do we foster connection with God? It looks different in every season. There were times, there's been decades in my life where I could really just sit down for an hour with the word of God and dig in there. I am a single mom of two kids, okay? Some days I'm just like, press play on the Bible. (laughs) You know what I mean? And you know, but the point is, I think the most important thing is there's no formula for the way to have the best relationship with Jesus, but it's showing up consistently and making space for intimacy with him. That's it, showing up consistently, making space for intimacy with him. The second thing is fostering attachment love with others. Love your neighbor. This is about neighborliness. This is about community. This is about connection to other people. God designed us and wired us for attachment and connection. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother or a sister is born for a time of adversity. And I have experienced this firsthand, you guys. I would not be here without my community. I would not be here without my friends who were at my side through every single bit of this season. And one of the beautiful things they did for me is they hosted a grief party for me. So I, um, 
after my divorce, went through grief recovery with the Grief Recovery Institute. It's a, it's a program that I've been through too many times, okay? I just, can't, I'd like a grief-free season. Anyways, whatever, here we are. Okay, so here I am, I'm in grief recovery again, and and basically the process, you really kind of evaluate the relationship, you look at the highs and lows, you really explore the entirety of it, and you have an opportunity at the end, it all culminates into a grief letter. And in that letter, you have the opportunity to express undelivered communication. So much of grief is about undelivered communication, all the things we didn't say, all the things we didn't get a chance to say, so you do that in the letter. And, um, and wishing things were different or better, right? And so you get to express all of that and it culminates into this completion letter that, that you say goodbye, you say goodbye to that, to that grief. And the final step in that process is reading your grief letter to someone else because we need a witness. We need witness. And so I sat with about you know five of my closest friends and they sat and bore witness as I read my grief letter to them. We need to experience vulnerability in safe relationship. We need healthy attachment with others. We need to be seen and known. We need people to show up for us as we reciprocate and show up for them as well. This is a part of how we heal. And I don't know where that part... Oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, There's actually a psychiatrist named um, Dr. Bruce Perry. And he is both a clinician and a researcher. And he's someone who gets called into some of the most like devastating traumatic events that have happened in our, in our world, for example, like 9-11 and um, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing or, or school shooting. So he gets called in to consult on these super, super traumatic events. And he has also looked at the trajectory of the lives of people who have experienced these very severe traumas. And what he discovered in his research is that more than therapy, more than anything else, the one thing that made the most significant impact in increasing resilience and increasing the ability to overcome trauma is healthy relationships. It's healthy attachment. He said the more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely they are to be able to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change, and the most powerful therapy is human love. So how do we foster attachment love with others? Like I said, we let ourselves be seen. We let people show up for us. That's hard for some of us, and we show up for others. And the final thing is fostering attachment love with ourselves. And sometimes it's hard to talk about self-love in church because I think it's often misconstrued as being like prideful and we get real nervous about, oh, you're going to love yourself too much. And, but the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So we can't really love our neighbor very well if we can't love ourselves very well. I mean, how many of you guys have experienced or know that if you are suffering and experiencing shame and jealousy and comparison or self-loathing, it is very difficult to love other people when we have that kind of experience within ourselves and those kinds of feelings towards ourselves. But the more we can experience ourselves as the beloved and experience the incredible love of God, it changes and shapes our identities. It changes and shapes the way we see ourselves. And it is from that place that we can outpour and then love other people well. What happens with trauma and these disruptions in in attachment is that they often create some really um, harmful internal messages. And sometimes this is happening, like I said, when we're infants on a pre-verbal level that I'm I'm not safe, I'm not wanted, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, right? And some of us struggle with these mental tapes that shape our lives in very profound ways. So one of the ways we repair and find loving attachment with ourselves is engaging in the process of renewing our minds, right? Take captive every thought and make it obedient to the word of God. Renewing our minds is a part of the process of transformation and it's a part of the process of restoring healthy relationship to ourselves. 
The other thing is, the second way that we can restore a loving relationship with ourselves is to be present to ourselves. To be present to ourselves right now in this moment. And this is something that I'm quite frankly very much learning right now as we speak. What does it look like to be very present to my own body, to my own feelings, to my own needs? Some of us get stuck and ruminating on the past, right? I don't tend to do that. Some of us get stuck in the future. And for a long time, I didn't realize that I was dealing with anxiety because my thoughts don't look like, oh my gosh, something bad's gonna happen, something bad's gonna happen. I thought that was anxiety, right? My anxiety has masked itself as productivity, okay? This is not fair or fun. I'm a very high capacity person. I have vision for days. My my to-do lists are two miles long, okay? I got to do this. I got to do that. And I'm going to do that. And then we're going to do this. And we're going to build that program. And I got vision over here. And I have to do do that. We're going to do that. And that's all future thinking. And and it can be so great because I can get so much done. But at the end of the day, my mind is on a hamster wheel and I am in anxiety because I'm constantly thinking about the next thing I have to do and the next thing I have to do. And I am not present with myself now and in my body now. So one of, my, one of my practices is to just do a body scan. What's happening in my body right now? What, what does my body need right now? For me, I have a, a note on my desk that says, how can I love you more? How can I love you more? And sometimes that means just stopping and having a glass of water. Like I'm a, I feel like I'm, you can ask the people who work at Treasures, but I feel like I'm a pretty good boss. Like I've, I'm very kind and gentle and I'm all about self-care and we even have a somatic practic- practitioner on staff that tends to the staff. Like I feel like I'm a pretty good boss for them. I'm a bad boss to me. I'm like, I don't care if you have to go to the bathroom, keep working, you got one more email to sell. I, I don't care if you're hungry, just keep going, keep going. <laughs> You'll eat later, right? I'm not, but this is what's happening, right? I just push and I push and I push and I push. And unfortunately, I have learned that the body keeps score, and you cannot do that forever. It is not sustainable. So being present to ourselves is one of the ways that we restore um, love. And practicing self-compassion. Practicing self-compassion. A lot of times we have these tapes in our heads are, are the shoulds. I should be here by now. I should have achieved that by now. I should have finished school. I should be married by now. I should have lost 10 pounds. I should start that diet tomorrow. I should start this beauty regime. I should, I should, I should, I should, I should. These, that's not self-compassion, right? That is not self-compassion. But practicing speaking to ourselves and responding to ourselves compassionately is a part of the process of restoring attachment to ourselves. And so what I want you to know today are a few things. Number one, God is with you. Whatever season you may find yourself in, God is with you. I would also encourage you that allowing yourself to experience healthy attachment with safe people, reciprocal relationship, true community, relationship where you can be seen and known is so powerful and a path to healing and wholeness, as is showing up for yourself and learning to love yourself well so that you can operate out of a place of knowing that you are the beloved and giving and loving others out of an outpouring and an outflow of that. And as we close today, I'm just gonna take a moment and I'd like to invite you to sit with some questions and we're gonna start with just getting connected to ourselves right now in this moment. And so the first invitation is just to get comfortable in your chair, whatever that looks like. Maybe you need to shift positions. Maybe you wanna close your eyes. Maybe your eyes are open, whatever it is. Get comfortable in your seat. And then I invite you to just notice your breath. Just notice your breath. The breath of life flowing through you. Is it shallow? Are you breathing into your chest? Is it expansive? Can you feel your breath in your rib cage and your belly?
And then I invite you to take a big, spacious breath. right now, can you invite God and his presence, his withness, can you invite him into this moment with you right here, right now? And maybe you want to sit with this question, God, what would it look like to make space for deeper connection with you. What are the things that are standing in the way of loving attachment? God, is there something that you're inviting me into? Is there something new, a new rhythm, a new practice, a new step of faith? Is there something new that you're inviting me into that would foster loving attachment with you, with myself, or with others? God, I thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Thank you that your presence is here with us now and your presence is here with us when we go, that you never leave us, Lord. Pray that you would give us a real revelation of that, Lord, that we would experience your witness in a new and powerful way, God that we would would experience the, the security and safety that comes from attachment with you. And that from that place of safety and security, that we would be courageous and brave to step out and live the life that you have called us to, God. I pray, God, that you would give us the bravery to engage intentionally in reciprocal relationship with safe people, God. And I pray, Lord, if if some of us in this room haven't been very good at honoring our, our temples, at loving ourselves, at being present to ourself, God, I pray that you would show us how we can love ourselves better, God, that you would give us revelations of your love. Let them transform the way we see ourselves, God. Let them transform the way we treat ourselves, the way we speak to ourselves. That we would be filled with with gentleness, God, towards ourself and towards others. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.